In this section of the course, we're going to look at an analysis technique called the slope deflection method or the slope deflection equations. By the end of the course, we'll be applying this method to frames that are not able to sway, so no sway frames, or frames that are able to sway, so have some lateral movement. So what I mean by that is we could have some kind of frame structure, and we fully support it on the bottom, and we could maybe apply some sideways loading to it, and this would result in deflections of the structure, and the relative displacement here would cause some met bending in this column section here. So it can become a little bit more complicated. But for the, to begin with, we're going to use this method purely for beams, get comfortable with beams, and then start looking at frame structures. So we can imagine we have a structure made entirely of a beam but there are multiple sections of this beam but it's continuous over supports because it's continuous over supports we will get some moment over the supports and what we're going to do is just zoom in on one portion of this beam so this portion of the beam a b at the ends of the beam we're going to have just cut off small little pieces from the ends of these beams and we're going to call these beam ends or nodes and this is the the word that gets used more often in computer analysis techniques but we'll move on to later but for now we're just going to consider the main span of the beam itself so we have some arbitrary loading across the beam which has a length l and because of this arbitrary loading and the loading on previous sections or sections further on in the beam, we will get some kind of displacement and rotations within this beam. And what we'd like to do, if we know the displacements or rotations at the end of the beams, be able to calculate what the end moments are on this beam. We'll go on later on to work out what goes on in the middle, but first of all, we'd like to know what happens at the ends of the beams in terms of moments and shears. So we're gonna build up equations to do that. So if I take this, and what we're trying to do is say to get MAB, we'd like to get this as a function of the rotation at A as a function plus the rotation at B plus a function of the relative displacement delta. So if both ends of this beam were to move down by the same amount, that would not induce any bending. However, if a was to move down a little bit, but B was to move down a lot more, and there was no rotation, then we would expect that that would cause bending in the beam, and therefore rotations inside the beam itself. And more importantly, it's how much, so if we call the, def the relative deflection delta, it's how much relative deflection we get over the length of the beam. So we can also imagine that this function would be a function of the beam's properties, its stiffness, its geometric properties, the second moment of area, and the length. And there would be some kind of coefficient on how much theta A has to do with the moment at MAB. Let's put a coefficient on B. So how much a rotation at the right-hand side would, cut, would add to the moment at the left-hand side. And again, another coefficient, let's call it C, how much this relative displacement would cause the moment MAB. So let's show that pictorially. 
So if we apply a rotation theta A, this would cause some contribution to the moment MAB. If we were to release, had no moment there, so release that, then this would go back to its neutral position, back to horizontal. Then again, if I had the rotation of theta B, I would expect this deflected shape. And if I had the relative displacement, I would expect this deflected shape. And I could add all of those up and know the contributions from all of those three. So that is what happens because of rotations and deflections at the ends of the beam. But if we look at our beam, we also know we have some loading on the beam and this loading, if the beam was simply supported, would cause a deflected shape itself. So we need to add that contribution to get the full picture of what's going on in the beam. But if we have a simply supported beam, we can see that we get a rotation at the ends of the beam that we don't want. So we need to add a correction factor to this that will get us back to zero rotation at the ends of the beam. And this correction factor is what we call a fixed end moment. And we'll show you what these are as we go along. But this is what we're trying, an equation we can set up where we can get the moments at the end of a beam in terms of the rotations at the end of the beam and the deflections at the end of the beam plus some factor which accounts for the loading along the beam itself. And the way we do this is we release the, in this case, we release the moment constraint and apply a rotation theta. And if you use the unit load method, I show it in a, another video, we can get the moment at this left-hand side, MA, I'm calling it for now, is 4EI over L multiplied by this rotation theta. And again, in the unit load video, we can show that the moment that the rotation theta would cause at the right-hand side, MB, is half of MA, so is 2EI over L multiplied by theta. And this rotation also causes shears at the left-hand side, which is 6EI over L squared multiplied by theta. And at the right-hand side, again, 6EI over L squared multiplied by theta. We can also imagine a situation where we apply the displacement and work out what this causes in terms of shear forces and moments MA and MB at either end. And use, again, using the unit load or other force methods of analysis, we can show that the shear at caused at the left-hand side would be 12 EI over L cubed multiplied by the relative deflection delta. And the moments caused by this deflection, so MA would be equal to MB, which would be equal to 6EI over L squared. And sometimes it's good to note that we sometimes use the Greek letter psi, so PSI, to denote delta over L, because we have delta here and L here, delta and L in both these equations. And sometimes we rewrite them in this slightly different manner. Okay, so going back to the equations that we wish to set up, we wish to set up the moment in terms of the geometric properties, the stiffness properties, in terms of the rotations at either end, and the relative displacement, plus something to tell us about what's happening in between the ends of the beam. So in between, what does this force between A and B cause itself? And we get that via the fixed end moments. 
So we've got all of these coefficients that we can put into that formula, and we get that m over a b equals four e i times by theta a plus two e i over l multiplied by theta b minus six e i over l squared times delta plus this fixed end moment. So this fixed end moment it takes into account the simply supported case and the correction backwards from that. And these equations together, we need two of them, one for i over end of the beam, are called the slope deflection equations. And in writing these equations, I've changed the notation slightly, so I've called this MAB, so this is the moment at A, looking towards B, and I have the opposite, the moment at B, looking towards A. So armed with these equations, in the next video, I'm going to show how we can use these equations to analyze a beam that is indeterminate by solving, first of all, for these member end rotations or deflections to get our member end moments and finally get the bending moment across the whole of the structure by using what we know about the bending moments in simply supported structures. We'll also talk about these fixed end moments a little bit more but bef before we rush on to the example it's worth just talking about these. So if we have a beam, and if this beam is simply supported, and we apply a load on there, in this case, I'm going to apply a point load on there. We would get a deflected shape like this. As a result, we would get a rotation, it's called theta, at either end. However, if we had a beam structure, the same beam, but it was fully fixed at either end, but we applied exactly the same load, we would now get a deformed shape where we would have no rotation at the ends because of the support condition. But we'd still get a deflection in the middle. So the fixed end moment is the moment that we would need to apply to a simply supported beam to return the rotation back to zero, the correcting factor. And this correcting factor could be calculated, for example, using the unit load method. We're not going to show the derivation on this course. But what you can do is find tables of these correction factors for standard load cases in the back of textbooks.